Okay. Hello to everybody. Uh, this is a fourth uh, meeting uh, with the Professor uh, Sheldon Solomon. Uh, the, issue, the topic of uh, this meeting is existential con concern in a material materialistic world. I think we are waiting for you, from you, uh, Sheldon, because uh, this issue is absolutely fantastic and we are really um, we are really involved uh, in your uh, talk because uh, I think we are prepared to listen uh, to you and uh, understand everything you want to explain us uh, on uh, your existential perspective. Well, thank you very much and uh, good morning or good afternoon or good evening uh, to uh, uh, everybody and uh, best wishes the, for um, everyone wherever we are at uh, uh, most uncertain and uh, the difficult time, uh, which is also if we want to take the existentialists seriously, uh, times of crisis, uh, also uh, fertile opportunities uh, for uh, radical transformations of uh, positive nature. And uh, so uh, the, I've had the great fortune of um, being with you all uh, from a distance. Uh, this will be our fourth day together. And, and for those that are just joining us today, we've been considering terror management theory and uh, research um, in the context of uh, a broader concern uh, about how issues surrounding death and dying um, can serve to enrich uh, our lives. And uh, we've talked about terror management theory, uh, which simply posits that to manage the uh, potentially debilitating anxiety engendered by the uniquely human awareness of death, uh, that uh, we embrace culturally constructed beliefs that give us a sense that life has meaning and that we have value. And we talked about research consistent uh, with this idea. And we also talked about the unfortunate fact that um, mostly uh, our reactions to intimations of uh, mortality uh, are quite unconscious and uh, quite defensive. Uh, when we're reminded of death, we become more hostile to people who are different, uh, we're more likely to vote uh, for Hitler-like populist leaders, uncomfortable with our bodies, uncomfortable with nature. Uh, we're reduced uh, to insatiably greedy shoppers and consumers of stuff. Uh, and it amplifies uh, uh, pre-existing psychological disorders. And then uh, yesterday we talked a bit about, at least abstractly, um, what one could do. The last chapter of our book, The Worm at the Core, is called Living with Death. And uh, uh, from, our, from a terror management theory vantage point, um, well, there's two general directions one could go in. It would be coming to terms with death or, or uh, tinkering uh, with belief systems uh, that might foster the cultivation uh, of psychological equanimity without doing uh, any collateral damage to other people uh, in the world around us. And, and so what I was hoping to do today is to continue along those lines and, and uh, to think about how we might proceed both clinically uh, and conceptually um, in uh, our particular uh, moment in time. Uh, and um, with that in mind, and, and let's just proceed. Um, I, I read a book a few years ago by Richard Beck uh, called The Slavery of Death. And this is a very interesting scholar who's a PhD in experimental psychology. I believe he is also an ordained minister or at least has a, 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 a tremendous background um, in religion. Uh, and one of the points that Beck makes uh, is that um, the quest for self-esteem 
in the pursuit uh, of psychological equanimity uh, can be problematic. Uh, and well, what I would submit is that it's particularly problematic in cultures uh, that are a tad uh, narcissistic uh, to begin with. Uh, and um, if we had a little bit more time today, I would urge all of you to take a look at a book by a Harvard philosopher. His name is Michael Sandel, and it's called The Tyranny of Merit. Uh, and what, uh, what Sandel points out is that in a, in a lot of industrialized democracy, uh, that people of all political persuasions uh, are typically excited uh, about meritocracy, the idea that what is best is to have an arrangement where everybody has a chance to succeed. Uh, and, um, and then you just hope that uh, everyone tries their best. But as Sandel points out, um, implicit, if not explicit, in these kinds of social arrangements is that the only thing that matters is being the best at what you do. And his point is, and it's an obvious one, is that if you think in those terms, then N minus one people in every conceptual category are by those standards, uh, abject failures or, or losers. Uh, and uh, the result is a population of people that are either demoralized uh, or enraged. Uh, and what Beck proposes um, is actually just a reversion to ancient wisdom. And, and that is to think about other ways uh, that we can obtain psychological equanimity that infuse our lives with meaning and give us a, a sense uh, of value, but does so in a way that is ultimately different than and superior to uh, just thinking that you're better than everyone else around you. All right, so what would that take? Uh, well, one way to think about this is that it's time for the human race to grow up. Uh, if we had more time, I'd argue that it's time for the human race to wake up in order to grow up. Some of you might remember Plato with the allegory of the cave uh, when he talked about uh, in metaphorical terms uh, that all of the people in the cave, they're, they're, in, they're in the dark, they're ignorant. And at the end of the cave, he's like, it's like they're sleeping. Uh, and uh, uh, part of why we got to get people out of the cave, and by the way, those of you that are familiar with the tale, remember that when the prisoners are freed from their chains, they don't run out of the cave into the sunlight. They have to be dragged there. Uh, and so I like this idea as a metaphor that uh, we need to wake up. I wish that it wasn't confused with this idea of being woke today because that has political connotations. But I think it's right-minded. Also, some of you might remember that uh, Freud referred to neurosis as dreaming uh, while awake. And, and so I like that. And I like Geza Roheim on the left uh, when he talks about uh, that civilization is like a baby who's afraid of being left alone uh, in the dark. And so metaphorically, I think it's time for the human race to get out of diapers, to get to the point uh, where in existential terms, uh, we are sufficiently mature uh, to be able to accept the reality of the human condition. And, and I've been working with a very talented group of doctors, and I believe I alluded to this yesterday, we're designing uh, existential interventions for traumatized healthcare workers. And Linda Emanuel, very talented physician and psychoanalyst, um, she's used, or she has coined the term, or we're borrowing it from folks, uh, existential maturity uh, as kind of the flip side uh, of terror management. Uh, you know, terror management uh, just suggests that we're doing enough to ward off debilitating existential terror. Now the question is, can uh, we do a little bit 
better than that. And when I started working with these doctors, we were uh, more specifically interested uh, in helping physicians manage terror in the context of the pandemic. Uh, but I, I think at this point, an argument can be made that a, a substantial proportion of Earth has been adversely affected uh, by the pandemic. And that's why I've been saying lately, uh, we're all uh, good candidates for palliative care. Uh, I like uh, how an Italian philosopher, Sylvia Benso, she lives and works in the US, but I believe she started her education uh, in Italy. And in her book, The Face of Things, um, she has a term that I think is compatible with this idea of existential maturity. And she calls it uh, embodied wisdom. She says, look, uh, philosophy, uh, you know, we usually think about it as the love uh, of wisdom, uh, but uh, her point uh, following Heidegger and a lot of other folks is that philosophy took a wrong turn thousands of years ago uh, in Theatetus, the, the platonic dialogue uh, where you've got Thales, the philosopher walking around looking in the clouds, and he's so preoccupied with his celestial ponderings that he doesn't notice that there's a well in front of him, and he tumbles into the well. And meanwhile, there's a slave girl watching all this, and she just bursts out uh, in merry laughter. And Heidegger's point is that, well, philosophers, we've been following the guy that fell in the well, people that are so trafficking in abstractions that that's how we got the Cartesian world uh, of uh, the disembodied soul, uh, just trafficking in pure abstractions. Uh, and uh, Benso's point following Heidegger is that we've got to go back and start philosophizing from the perspective uh, of the young woman. Uh, and she calls this embodied wisdom, borrowing from Emmanuel Levinas, who said, you know, I'm not so concerned about uh, the love of wisdom. I'm more concerned about the wisdom uh, of love. Uh, and uh, I've been getting acquainted with Levinas's work. Perhaps the next time uh, we get to exchange ideas, we can talk more about it directly. Uh, but I like Levinas's view uh, that uh, this one way of thinking about this is that it's ultimately an ethical consideration and, and that uh, what we are striving for, at least as an abstraction, uh, it is a world in which we can have meaningful relationships with others uh, in a fashion uh, that does no damage, literally or figuratively, uh, to the other by virtue of that relation. All right, so uh, the question is, okay, uh, uh, what to do, how to do. Uh, one area of inquiry that appears very promising is the idea uh, of mindfulness. Uh, and uh, mindfulness is just a Western extrapolation of thousands of years of thought that is often attributed uh, the two Eastern thinkers, uh, although there's clearly shades of it uh, in lots of theological as well as philosophical approaches. Uh, and uh, the idea we've got the be here now, some of you will remember that's from Aldous Huxley's Island. He won a Nobel Prize in literature um, uh, for that, I don't know, 1960 maybe-ish. Um, and uh, But uh, two dimensions to mindfulness, and I'm only going to talk about one of them today. Um, uh, underlying uh, mindfulness, some argue, certainly underlying all uh, meditative techniques um, is control of respiration. So breathing uh, is important. And some of you might have heard of uh, the Julian James's book, The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, uh, where James points out that the word to be in Greek means to breathe. Uh, and of course, to be alive means to breathe. And I did a bunch of studies in my youth over 40, 45 years ago where we demonstrated 
uh, that the uh, reduced rate of respiration and inhaling more deeply um, uh, the, definitely reduces autonomic arousal in anticipation of stressful events. The other part of the mindfulness enterprise, though, is more cerebral. And it has to do uh, with being keenly aware of the immediate moment. Uh, and uh, there's a number of studies, I didn't want to bog us down today um, uh, too much um, it, uh, in terms of empirical studies, but here's a recent one by Tom uh, and one of his students, um, a Korean student, and this one uh, was done uh, partly uh, in Korea with uh, Buddhists who were either familiar or not familiar with meditation. Uh, and then it was also replicated um, in uh, the US. Uh, and uh, you all know how to read, but the, the tenor of these findings um, is that engaging in meditative techniques reduces or eliminates the defensive reactions that are typically engendered uh, by a mortality salience induction. And, and so, uh, and this is by no means the only piece uh, of empirical data uh, that is in accord uh, with the view uh, that mindfulness can uh, be a tremendously uh, effective way to manage existential concerns. And, and by the way, I, I should point out, and this is apropos to uh, something that Emmanuel said yesterday when uh, he was asking about different kinds of attachment styles and, and whether or not it might be the case uh, that there are different kinds of approaches to managing existential terror uh, that might be differentially beneficial depending upon uh, the individual in question. And so uh, as we trot through uh, these various approaches uh, to effectively managing existential terror, uh, let's just note uh, that uh, this is not necessarily a, a one size fits all uh, as much as the proverbial clinical toolkit uh, that eclectic practitioners uh, might be able to parlay into effective therapeutic relationships as they get to know uh, the people that they're helping. Uh, really uh, uh, exciting in my mind uh, is recent work based on ancient wisdom uh, about gratitude and humility. Uh, and um, gratitude and humility are foundational. Uh, I, I am unaware of any religion that does not stress uh, the idea of gratitude uh, and humility, All right? Gratitude first, uh, I like this guy Chesterton over a hundred years ago uh, when he said the truth is that all genuine appreciation rests on a certain mystery of humility and almost darkness. The man who said, blessed is he that expecteth nothing for he shall not be disappointed put the eulogy quite inadequately and even falsely. The truth is, blessed is he that expecteth nothing, for he shall be gloriously surprised. The man who expects nothing sees redder roses than common men can see, and greener grass and a more startling sun. Blessed is he that expecteth nothing, for he shall possess the cities and the mountains. Blessed is the meek, for he shall inherit the earth. And here's my favorite line, until we realize that things might not be, we cannot realize that things are. Until we see that darkness, we cannot admire the light. As soon as we have seen that darkness, all light is lightning, sudden, blinding, and divine. And again, one of my favorite lines, it is one of the million wild jests of truth that we know nothing until we know nothing. So I, I'm a big fan of gratitude in part uh, because most of us, thankfully and gratefully, have a lot to be grateful for. 
Uh, my point is that, you know, anybody who woke up today uh, having slept in a house and having had breakfast or lunch, uh, we have lots uh, to be grateful. And I like how John Milton puts it on the bottom uh, when he says gratitude makes us reverent and reverence uh, is what uh, makes uh, enlightenment quite ordinary and extraordinary because we, we are grateful, that makes us reverent, and that gives us these moments of transcendental awe. I, now, I didn't want to bury you in research, so I'll just tell you that uh, there's a small literature now, and uh, it has shown two things. One is, is that people reminded of their mortality report being more grateful. More importantly, perhaps, we did a study at Skidmore that we're in the process of replicating, where we just ask people to uh, reflect on something that they're grateful for. And we found that that reduces uh, death thought accessibility. Uh, and so uh, we see gratitude uh, as just a, a foundational affectation uh, that is widely available to other individuals. And you don't have to get into a pissing match to say that you're more grateful than the person next to you. Uh, and so I like gratitude and humility in part because it's not a uh, hierarchically arranged uh, packing order uh, where you're measuring yourself relative to those around you. It's just something that's readily available uh, to all of us. All right? And so uh, let's talk about awe and humility. Uh, there's a guy named Kirk Schneider, and he was a student of Rollo May. Um, he's at the Saybrook Institute in California, and I think he's running for president of the American Psychological Association, no matter, but he writes books uh, about awe uh, and humility. Uh, and uh, St. Augustine said it pretty well a couple of centuries or millenniums ago, do you wish to be great? then begin by being. Do you desire to construct a vast and lofty fabric? Think first about the foundations of humility. The higher your structure is to be, the deeper must be its foundation. All right, and then one of uh, Tom's students, Palin Kessiber, uh, has done a remarkable series of studies uh, showing uh, that humility it is a potent existential anxiety buffer. Uh, and let's note, if it's not already evident, that humility is not the same of, uh, as self-deprecation, um, although it's often perceived as such in our, unfortunately, and highly narcissistic culture. Uh, but here's Palin's description uh, of what a humble person is like. A humble person is first and foremost capable of tolerating an honest look at the self and non-defensively accepting weaknesses alongside strengths. This does not represent a sense of inferiority or self-denigration, but rather lack of self-aggrandizing biases. The propensity for seeing the self in true perspective is typically accompanied by an awareness of the self's smallness in the grand scheme of things. Humble people tend to be more sensitive and feel more connected to forces larger than themselves. Be this force God, humanity, nature, or the cosmos. Finally, and relatedly, those who stand in humility exhibit a remarkable lack of self-focus and a talent for self-forgetfulness, for becoming unselved. They are easily able to take themselves out of the middle of the picture and direct attention toward the greater world beyond in seeing, honoring, and potentially contributing to something bigger than themselves. They transcend egotistical concerns and the attendant urge for defensive self-serving maneuvers. And, and I, I, I like that view. Maybe it's that uh, I'm just getting old, but I, I like the idea that I'm an inconsequential speck uh, uh, respiring uh, carbon-based dust uh, born in a time and place not of my choosing uh, here uh, for an infinitesimally small 
amount of time uh, before uh, I am uh, reabsorbed into the cosmos. And I, I love the idea uh, that I might be able to do something along the way that maybe makes the world a little bit better. Eric Erickson's uh, idea of generativity and be that as it may, what Palin has found in her work uh, is that humble people, uh, dispositionally humble people do not respond in a defensive fashion when they're reminded of their mortality. More importantly, perhaps, people who uh, are asked to be humble, a humility salience prime, uh, that that turns out uh, to reduce or eliminate defensive reactions uh, to mortality salience inductions. All right, let's talk a little bit uh, now about stories. I'm just trying to see uh, who we got with us. If uh, Inez, I'm looking at you now. Can you see me? Do we have uh, Do we have Emmanuel with us? I'm not sure if we do. I'm here. Hi, yes. Sheldon. Oh, nice, Emmanuel. This is awesome. I, I want, I'm going to say something for 30 seconds and then defer to the expert because basically there, there is a, 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 if some of you that were uh, with us on day one. Uh, remember that I talked about different ways of conceiving of what is the essence uh, of our humanity. You know, we talked about Homo sapiens were wise, uh, Homo ludens were playful. A uh, homo faber, we make stuff. Homo aestheticus, uh, we like pretty things. Uh, and then I, I use the term homo narratans, which a Norwegian author, can't remember his name, coined uh, a while back. Uh, and the idea here is just that we're fundamentally storytelling creatures. Um, uh, there's now a, a branch of evolutionary psychology devoted uh, to understanding the evolution uh, of stories. Uh, Rollo May, in his great book, The Cry for Myth, uh, makes a, a tremendous case uh, for the idea that uh, myths are, uh, uh, well, myths are stories, uh, and uh, that it is through uh, dynamic engagement uh, with these kinds of narratives uh, that we are able to conceive of a world as we would like it to be, uh, and in so doing, uh, bring ourselves together uh, in a communal sense, uh, but also uh, that uh, these stories uh, become essentially blueprints uh, for future action. Um, I've always been a big fan uh, of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Uh, and um, in, in the preface of that book, her husband, Percy Shelley, writes about fiction uh, that, uh, that it's super important. It affords a point of view to the imagination for the delineating of human passions more comprehensive and commanding than any which the ordinary relations of existing events can yield. Right. English translation, there is something uh, really of, of critical value uh, that one uh, acquires uh, by virtue uh, of, uh, of uh, engagement uh, with fiction. Uh, it, they are stories and they do interest us, but they do a lot more than that. And the first people that I'm aware of to take that idea literally and to demonstrate the, the veracity of it empirically uh, was by Emmanuel and his folks. And so, yeah, let me, I'm gonna mute myself and, and have Emmanuel tell us what he's been up to because I see this as some of the most important work on the horizon. Uh, hi, Shella, I feel like I'm being put on the spot. I, th I think you're just being lazy. You're supposed to be talking today. I am being lazy, but it's okay. Well, I, I I get it. I get it. <laughs> so, um, well, um, I, you know, I'm not the first one, of course, to, to be doing this. Thank you, Sheldon, for for your you know appreciation of my work. I, I you know I, of course, I'm I'm honored that you think so. 
uh, you know, there is mostly key totally, I think from an empirical standpoint, I think, you know, of course, you know, the idea has been around forever. J Jerry Bruner, you know, wrote the whole book about it on the, comparing the narrative mode of thinking and the pragmatic mode of thinking. And I think what you, what Sheldon is discussing here is, uh, uh, it's really about the importance of, of this narrative mode, right? Uh, and uh, I think, you know, people like Habermas, uh, you know, Habermas the young, not, not, the, not the elder. Uh, has discussed about the, the sense of self and the construction of the self and how important the narrative um, is for that process, right? Um, and, um, you know, I, I, uh, I used to work a lot on, on, on the questions that are really at the core of, uh, you know, that stem from Beckers and from, from the work of Sheldon and Jeff and, and, and Tom and many others on, on theorem management theory on the, um, on the importance of social identities in buffering existential anxiety. Uh, but now then, you know, over the last almost 10 years, I moved on to something a little bit different, uh, mostly on looking at fiction and uh, building a little bit on, on what Keith Oatley and, and Raymond Marr uh, primarily, uh, you know, have done. And my, most of my published work so far has been on the, um, on the advantages that certain kinds of fiction provide you with. Uh, and most, most of the published findings uh, are on, 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 on theo mind. So TOM as opposed to TMT. Uh, and you know, and the, the, bad, the underlying idea is that, that uh, the fiction differs. And there are you know, many different kinds of fiction, but we focus on the distinction between, uh, between popular fiction and, and literary fiction. And, and we show you know, experimentally, correlationally that it's really, uh, the latter kind of fiction, the, what we call literary fiction, a, a debatable Man, if you get a... Hello? I heard somebody talking. Okay, I'll ignore. Okay. Um, you know, it's really the literary fiction that really, that fosters theory of mind. Uh, now we have uh, other findings uh, published in the last year, like a couple of papers coming out now in the next few weeks that extend this and look at other, at other social cognition types of variables. But I think that the link um, uh, that, I, that I'm interested in, in, in discussing with you today and with Sheldon, in fact, when I found out about this series of seminar um, I, uh, and I asked uh, Ines uh, about them, um, you know, I, I mentioned this idea because the, a lot of uh, what TNT has shown is that, you know, is that the importance of this uh, uh, collectively shared understanding of realities. Because that really makes us makes makes us feel like we belong, that we are that we are more than our individual self, more than our animal self, and hence all these metaphors that Sheldon was mentioning. The last the last one of which is you know the storytelling animal, or you call it the narratus animals. But you know there is a book by Gottschall, right? This uh, literary study guy, so an excellent book called the storytelling animal. So the importance of storytelling in our evolutionary uh, history, and, uh, and a lot of anthropologists now, really Smith and others, you know making that 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 point uh but you know the, so now i'm coming a bit full circle with my interest because um one of the claims that we make and i started this work with david kidd who's my phd student um 10 years ago uh and now i continue with other people among others an italian philosopher who may be in the audience i sent him the link pietro perconti is a, a philosopher we won't hold that against him but um he's interested in 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 the questions that we are uh, and with him, I, I'm continuing this work. So the, the basic idea here is that um, the, the the reason why literary fiction, and now I have a paper coming out next week on, on films, showing that our films do the same than literary fiction and Hollywood films don't, just as popular fiction does. And I'm often, you know, I'm often accused of being reactionary uh, for saying these things. Um, and, uh, and so I've been trying to, in the process of defending myself, I was forced to elaborate my thinking a little bit better. Uh, and the point, and, and here's the link with the questions that are of interest to us today, is that um, literary fiction uh, has mostly um, uh, plots and characters that are more realistic, more undefined, less predictable. Uh, less cliche, uh, and the, the opposite is true for popular fiction and Hollywood movies, where where 
characters or types and uh, and our and stereotypes are are rehashed and and, and regurgitated uh, back to us continuously that's part of the reason why I enjoy we enjoy much more popular fiction in hollywood movies is because they are you know cognitively not very demanding because we can use all the what we call in social cognition heuristics you know for to understand what's going on you know we don't need to do much of the work of mentalizing um, that is required by by a literary fiction novel or or you know God forbid an art house movie, um, and hence the advantage that then the latter provides on on in, of, you know in in kind of a, uh, bringing online and sharpening some of our social cognition skills. Now, but the, maybe there is a price uh, for this uh, to pay, you know, and and because. Um, the, the, if it is true, if, if this caricature that we, we, we proposed of popular literary fiction, which, by the way, I think that is, is not an essentialistic view of this, of, I don't have any essentialistic view of these categories, it's just, you know, it, they, they are kind of, uh, they have a heuristic power now, you know, and they've had it for the last 60 or 70 years, and I don't know what it's going to be in, in 100 years, and, I, and it doesn't probably hold in all cultures, so I, I'm going to make this disclaimer, but within, within these boundaries, the idea is that um, uh, popular fiction, because it, it, it reinforces it, it, uh, our, it, it, um, it doesn't violate our expectations, uh, we, we find in the story what we expect, people's behave according to the stereotypes that we have about them and so on and so forth. Now, from a social psychological standpoint, that's horrifying because we, you know, we, we most of the social psychology want to undermine stereotyping and foster individuated perception. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure you all know what I'm talking about here. You know, Susan Fisk and Marilyn Brewer, the dual process model, all this idea. And Sheldon was, a, was used to be a social psychologist. We all used to be social psychologists once. Maybe we still are, not sure. Uh, so that's, you know, that's, uh, is bad from that point. And that's why in Hollywood there has been such a push over the last, you know, decades or more to really present characters in, in less stereotypical ways, right? Particularly about minorities for good reasons, obvious reasons that we don't want to, you know, stereotype people. Uh, but literary fiction and, and art films do, do the opposite, right? They, they really show us the humanity, the, the, the struggle, the exist some really are about the existential struggle of being human, you know, quite, quite straightforward now. But the problem is that if that's true, literary fiction and art movies enhance our existential anxiety because they undermine the very social structures that we share collectively. And, uh, and so it, a little bit of it is good. And in fact, you know, you, you remember, Sheldon, you remember in one of the Allen's movie that he gives Ernst Becker's book, The Night of Death, right? And and who's more neurotic than 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 Woody Allen, right? So, uh, why? Because it's it, because it's, it's collectively shared understanding of reality is 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 questioned uh, routinely by his own cultural products, what by you know uh, to some extent. So, that's really what I where, where I'm at and what I've been thinking about it for a few years without really engaging in. I've done a couple of attempts empirically, but I'm not you know I haven't really advanced much. But I'm I'd be curious to hear what you think, uh, Sheldon and everybody. Else, you know, it, it, so the, on the one end, you know, certain products that are, are good for certain things, you know, maybe they sharpen uh, your mind as, as we've seen. And now uh, we, we show, for instance, that it's associated with uh, also with less essentialistic thinking, um, less psychological essentialism. You know, we have paper just uh, is coming out very soon. Um, so more, more exposure to literary fiction is associated to less psychological essentialism, more exposure to popular fiction is associated with more. The, the result is less clear there, but you know the clearly opposite tendencies. Um, more attributional complexity, for instance, if you are engaged with, you know, if you're really exposed to a lot of literary fiction as opposed to popular fiction. But the other, uh, on the other hand, it may be, it may well be that uh, a diet of consuming a diet of literary fiction or movies is going to do very poorly in terms of your mental health because it really undermines this this socially shared structure. So. Um, uh, whereas, you know, whereas the popular, the, 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 you know, the satisfaction of seeing the bad guy punished and seeing people behave in the way we expect them to behave, um, you know, is, is psychologically satisfying. You know, that's why stereotypes are very hard to undermine, probably, right? But because they're, they're useful in, in a variety of ways. So that's that's where my thinking is, and I'm, I'm obviously I'm, I am very grateful to Ines to pro, you know, providing the the context where uh, they can be debated because we've been all separated for a long time. I haven't seen Sheldon or anybody else for years, and uh, and I never really shared. It's the first time that I actually you know uh, throw that idea there and say, is it worth exploring? Oh, thank you, Emanuele. 
So Sheldon. <laughs> now we wait for you. All right, here I am. Um, I, I think these are uh, fine ideas, Emmanuel, worth exploring. Because one of the questions that comes up uh, for me now, uh, almost every place, um, that, I mean, not to be silly, because you said, Emmanuel, I don't know if we're social psychologists anymore, because uh, I don't know if I am, because all of the interesting questions arise outside of our world. And that is one of the most, which is, yeah, is there a time, is there a developmental sequence where successive exposure uh, to mortality salience might at some point uh, uh, cease to elicit defensive reactions uh, and uh, not just towards the uh, more desirable ones that you're alluding to. You know, so it could be that, uh, you know, ongoing engagement uh, with the kind of fiction that is uh, psychologically disruptive, it could put us momentarily in a state of dis ease, but the payoff on the other end. Uh, might be worth it. Um, yeah, all right, let's come back to that. And uh, let me bounce through, uh, I think, yeah, let's do just one, one or two more things and, and then uh, let's open things up to everybody. Um, these are all the things where I think we should be going and where you all who are listening, I suspect are way ahead. Um, I think I already said this, um, I, I'm surrounded uh, by therapists. Uh, my wife, Maureen, is a therapist, and her degree was originally in dance therapy. Uh, my daughter, Ruby, is a therapist, and she was an art major uh, 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 who specialized in West African dance uh, when before she became uh, a therapist. And so I, I've been surrounded by therapists uh, all my life who are like dancing and drumming and drawing and singing. And they are all well-versed in, you know, traditional uh, dialogue, uh, but are, I believe are uh, way ahead of their time uh, in terms of seeing that the therapy of the future, uh, there'll be some talking, but there'll be lots of other things as well. And I like this book by a guy named Morris Berman. It was written 40 or 50 years ago. And it's, it's based on Max Weber's, the dead German sociologist. Uh, Weber said uh, that, the, that modernity has sucked the magic uh, out of life. That, that uh, what we got from our Cartesian universe is a mathematically precise description completely devoid uh, of meaning and value. Uh, and uh, so here we are, uh, Descartes great. He gave us the X and Y axis. Uh, we can fly people to the moon, uh, but uh, we're at a loss to explain why we would want to go there or what we would do once we arrived. Uh, and it, it was Weber who worried about uh, what would happen to humanity uh, when we, in the process of claiming our dominion over nature, uh, render it completely disenchanted. Uh, and um, so uh, art, music, play, drama uh, are all ways uh, of infusing uh, the world uh, with meaning, what these folks uh, would refer to uh, as to, to render it uh, re-enchanted. And we've done some work, I'm gonna spare you the details, but I like Ralph, where's Waldo Emerson uh, when he, he talks about um, art. I think we fly to beauty as an asylum from the terrors uh, of finite nature. And um, George Bernard Shaw talked about uh, how it is art uh, that ultimately shields us uh, from what would otherwise be uh, the unbearable cruelty uh, of life in general. Nietzsche, of course, quite the lunatic, but he says, without music, life would be a mistake. 
And we just did a, a fine study that we, we want to replicate um, where we showed uh, that uh, we asked people to come into the lab and we asked them to bring one of their favorite songs from childhood. And then we reminded them of their mortality or not. And then we had them listen to one of their favorite songs or, or just a neutral piece of music. And we found that a favorite song from childhood uh, buffered existential anxieties. And so we think that music, and there's a big history here. Some of you might know uh, uh, Stephen Miffin's book, The Singing Neanderthals, uh, where uh, Miffin uses ideas by Ellen Dizanayake, um, uh, 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 who, uh, who argue that music originated long before language, and it originated in the context of the mother and child interaction, and that it is central to establishing existential security. I, dancing, drumming, singing, um, uh, we've been doing that since female primates started having babies. Uh, and so uh, art, music, play uh, are all symbolic extrapolations from the most basic um, uh, attributes uh, of what renders us uh, safe and secure. Uh, and I, I like uh, Tom Stoppard from, uh, I don't know if you know some of his plays, but uh, from the Arcadia play, uh, uh, where and this is set in the Middle Ages, uh, where people, you got Newton given like the three laws, uh, you know, with everything tending towards entropy, and therefore the earth is going to turn into a black hole. And you have this Septimus dude uh, just realizing, as Pascal did, uh, the existential implications of that idea. And he says, when we have found all the mysteries and lost all the meaning, we will all, we'll be all alone on an empty shore. And then Thomasina, the little girl genius, uh, her response, then we shall dance. And, and we're doing some studies now to see if dancing uh, has um, uh, uh, the qualities that uh, diminish existential anxieties. I, I have spoken all too much, so I want to say one more thing, and then we're going to wrap it up, and that is that um, at the end of the Sylvia Benso book, The Face of Things, um, she argues based on Levinas's ideas primarily uh, that uh, on behalf of a stance towards life that she calls tenderness. And she's very clear when you see the word tenderness, you usually think of something weak and passive and sentimental. But she's like, no, I want you to pay attention to the word tenderness, particularly, particularly the tend part, right? Because it's a verb. When we tend to something, it's because we care about it. When we tend to something, uh, we stretch, we extend ourselves uh, when we attend to people that we care about. So she sees tenderness as kind of an, a superordinate stance on life that would be reflected in what she calls uh, festivity and celebration. Her point, it's a very Rollo May point uh, where May talks about a uh, community uh, and ritual, uh, and he describes ritual as a myth enacted in our daily activities. Uh, and this goes way back to Durkheim. Uh, let's end by reminding ourselves that the word religion comes from a Latin word that I don't know, uh, but the Latin word that I don't know means to bind. Uh, and that uh, we had religion long before we had gods, uh, and that the, uh, according to the evolutionary types, the original function of religion uh, was to foster a social cohesion and to provide a communal substrate for us to express 
um, what it is that is most exciting about being alive. So this is from some Durkheim website. According to Durkheim, a religion comes into being as is legitimated through moments of what he calls collective effervescence. All right, collective effervescence refers to moments in societal life when the group of individuals that makes up a society comes together in order to perform a religious ritual. During these moments, the group comes together and communicates in the same thought and participates in the same action, which serves to unify a group of individuals. When individuals come into close contact with one another and when they are assembled in such a fashion, a certain electricity is created and released, leading participants to a high degree of collective emotional excitement or delirium. This impersonal extra individual force, which is the core element of religion, transports the individuals into a new ideal realm, lifts them outside of themselves and makes them feel as if they are in contact with an extraordinary energy. Uh, in other words, and I think this is important, I think we need to get back. Um, I'm not saying we go back to the good old days and sit on the floor of a cave, what I am saying, though, is that we go back and remind ourselves that some of our most basic and foundational human attributes uh, are based not only uh, on a fear of death, they're also based uh, on a love of life. All right, I, I will shut up in a minute, but I, I want to thank you for uh, listening to me or pretending to do so uh, for the last couple of days. I want to uh, invite you, if you feel like it, to write to me. Uh, if anybody's interested uh, in our book, I'd be happy to send you uh, uh, an electronic copy of it. In the old days, I would mail you a copy, but they, if, if, you're, if you're local, I can do that. Uh, but they won't let me send stuff uh, around Earth anymore. But anyone who'd like to see our book, uh, happy to send you a copy. Um, and so, yeah, let's on, on a high note. Life is great. Um, it's great for my dog on the left uh, and it's great for my cat or it was great. This is Cupcake on the top right and I only have her today. Um, she died two years ago uh, and uh, she was 20 years old. And um, this is Cupcake at four o'clock in the afternoon on the day of her death. Uh, she was dead four hours later, uh, and she had not eaten for two weeks. Uh, and um, I found I learned more from uh, accompanying my pets at the end of their life uh, than I have from trying to train myself to be a mature human. And so uh, my great wish is to be able to continue enjoying my life uh, in a matter that is commensurate uh, with the creatures that I've been fortunate to surround myself with. So uh, thank you very much. I'm going to stop the sharing and um, yeah, let's do some talking. Oh, thank you, Sheldon. Very moving uh, your uh, talk and uh, absolutely interesting, uh, great issues. Uh, Alberto, uh, do you have uh, any questions? Yeah. I don't know. Well, first of all, thank you, Sheldon. Very, very interesting talk with, uh, with many um, issues that usually we don't see in social psychology. So it's good to, to broaden, uh, to widen our horizons. And well, uh, I was thinking, the, listening to your talk, that maybe a key point could be self-distancing. I mean, uh, you showed the uh, clearly that uh, there are some variables that can reduce the death anxiety and uh, 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 death-related thoughts. And these are mindfulness and gratitude and all oh, humility. And these are all variables that are connected to self-distancing. So I was thinking also about uh, maybe the centering or non-attachment and of course also spirituality in a broader sense. Uh, but uh, it is important for me to uh, underline that uh, uh, it is a, a kind of self-distancing, but uh, at the same time, it is an approach to a more deep self. So 
we distance from uh, something we can call a daily life self, something we live in without being aware of uh, living with it, uh, more related to egocentric uh, stance uh, or, and also to materialistic values. And then uh, thanks to this, uh, um, these concepts, uh, mindfulness, gratitude, and so on, we, we um, take a distance from this kind of self and we approach to a more deep self. And so uh, it's not really self-distancing. It's a distancing from a particular kind of self and an approach to another kind of self. And I think that maybe this is a key point also to to investigate in, uh, in research. Uh, I, I don't know if there is something uh, uh, on this, but uh, this, uh, these were my thoughts uh, during, uh, during your talk. And thank you, thank you really for, for, uh, for your uh, intervention. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Alberto. I think these are good, good ideas worthy of uh, future pursuit. And for mindfulness, it is uh, for me important that uh, uh, mindfulness is related to be more connected to reality. And so uh, reality can also be related to death, uh, to suffering. Uh, and uh, sometimes we try to be distant from these issues. And uh, our society, of course, is don't, doesn't want to talk uh, uh, about these topics because they are not related to materialistic values. And so uh, mindfulness, meditation, spirituality can uh, take people more close to reality, more deep reality. And then maybe this is why mindfulness can reduce uh, uh, death anxiety. Because I was thinking about uh, meditation of, on breath that is a, a technique uh, practice uh, useful to be more close to actual reality and to lose uh, some uh, stereotypes uh, mental images and, and so on and so this could be also a key point okay thank you thank you alberto fantastic this idea i can uh, absolutely uh, uh, I am absolutely agree with your uh, uh, perspective, Alberto, because uh, I saw that uh, in uh, experience of death and dying, uh, 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 particularly uh, meditation can help, uh, pray and meditation, because uh, um, meditation and pray permit uh, uh, to have a contact uh, with the transcendence, uh, and so to go beyond uh, um, the material reality. What about Sheldon uh, transcendence? Because uh, uh, there is uh, the ontological differences in Heidegger perspective. So, in uh, I think that Heidegger isn't so able able to discuss uh, the possibility of. Uh, uh, demonstrate uh, the existence of God because in his perspective, God uh, is uh, uh, an, uh, an error uh, in philosophical, ontological uh, um, thinking. But uh, what about the possibility of uh, being in contact with something like, uh, maybe like that God? Uh, transcendence, that uh, pray and uh, meditation, I don't know, mindfulness, um, maybe that also mindfulness can, can help in this uh, or move in this direction. What about, uh, what is your opinion in this, uh, uh, with respect to this uh, dimension? Um, my opinion, um, Ines, and that's, that's a fine question. My, my opinion is that, well, I think I mentioned I'm just, this is to my discredit um, because I've just read Heidegger for the first time like two years ago. This is nothing to be proud of, but in the United States, in order to get a PhD in psychology, you have to know nothing because if you do know anything, they hold it against you. So I, I obtained a PhD unscathed by knowledge 
and it's taken me 45 years to try and acquire the equivalent of a high school education in the Middle Ages. I be that as it may, I read Heidegger and I found it um, him, except that he's a Nazi, I found a lot of his ideas uh, very compelling. But now reading Levinas, and uh, if I understand Levinas's respectful critique of Heidegger, I am finding myself more attracted to Levinas for I think reason that, for Ines, the reason that you propose, which is Levinas argues that Heidegger doesn't go far enough or high enough yeah, uh, yeah. or deep enough. Uh, and uh, that there's uh, to, to playfully borrow from Heidegger that there's a horizon beyond the horizon that he alludes to. And I, I believe that that's where we need to be making our way towards um, uh, as um, in terms of where this discourse goes. And so I'm very excited about being part of this enterprise because uh, my understanding um, is that the, the program that uh, you have at the university is really focused on a dynamic integration of these various disciplinary perspectives yeah, in the in the service uh, of uh, making some progress. So yes, I I, I am uh, very much uh, preoccupied with these ideas uh, of transcendence, uh, and I'm also interested. I, some of you have probably seen the research. Um, uh, I'm more familiar with what's happening in the United States right now, but have you seen some of the work with uh, psilocybin or and hallucinogens um, being used now in clinical settings? Has anybody seen that work where um, uh, more uh, depressed people and terminally ill people uh, are in a single session uh, of uh, either MDMA uh, young people, that's ecstasy, but without being cut with rat poison, uh, and um, or uh, psilocybin mushrooms, uh, there are uh, immediate uh, and long-standing effects. Uh, Enos, along the lines of what we found in the near-death uh, experience study, uh, and uh, there are now researchers, I don't know who they are because I've been looking at some grant applications that I'm reading as an anonymous reviewer, but there are some folks who based on terror management theory and based on that work, they're now wanting to do experiments to see if uh, uh, micro doses of psychedelics uh, might yeah. uh, uh, be uh, useful. Interesting, really. There is also Marshall Linean. Uh, Marshall Linean uh, is particular because uh, uh, her uh, approach is behavioral, cognitive and behavioral, but uh, she uses also mindfulness and meditation in the conviction that uh, this permit to go really beyond reality, material reality. And uh, she is convicted uh, that uh, uh, this is a real dimension that uh, um, can cure uh, the suffering of people. Uh, in her uh, opinion, it is impossible uh, healing, it is impossible to solve the existential uh, problem without uh, this dimension. And uh, I think it is really interesting because uh, she's also able to uh, cure people who uh, attempt a suicide or uh, psychotic uh, people. And uh, I think it is uh, really interesting uh, uh, find, uh, uh, to finding the, uh, uh, the bridge between psychology and uh, this uh, that uh, we can define philosophical dimension, but I think uh, it is uh, also a psychological dimension. I don't know, this is in my opinion. Of course, I have to 
work with the people who really are really uh, uh, in anxiety for their uh, death, for their dying. So I think that it could be really interesting to uh, integrate uh, uh, this uh, dimension together. So thank you so much for your incredible uh, perspective shared on your ability to um, to open the uh, um, the horizon of uh, reflection on death and dying, and uh, to integrate the um, empirical perspective of uh, uh, social psychology uh, uh, methodology, and also to explain everything uh, in other uh, words. So uh, uh, now we have also Hodor Kidi, Professor Hodor Kidi, uh, you are welcome. Um, Thank is you, very single, uh, <laughs> uh, yes. What's happening in Tel Aviv? Uh, we are hoping for the, uh, for the um, military situation to be finished soon. With, yeah, that's what uh, we're hoping. We really uh, we really yeah. hope everything uh, is solved uh, soon. So, Thank the, you. do you have any questions for Sheldon? We have only five, ten minutes. Yes, I have two points to, uh, to, to, uh, to, to share, and I'm wondering what is your perspective on that. One is that I am, uh, I've been working in the last few years about uh, positive psychology and psychodrama. And I've written and published about it uh, several papers. And uh, one of the questions that I um, that I know, one of the points that I that I would like to share is that in addition to gratitude, for example, one of the um, past dimensions that that are that have been uh, many many researchers have been studying is forgiveness. And the issue of forgiveness, I would like to, uh, the process of forgiveness, and I would like to say that uh, um, because we are planning some interventions and I'm very intrigued and inspired by your theory, so I'm trying to think how we can also take the forgiveness. Just one point to clarify is that forgiveness doesn't mean, mean a redemption or saying that the person is is okay or whatever they did, the wrongdoing is, is okay or, or uh, uh, accepted. No, it means in, 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 in the view of this positive psychology that we are um, releasing um, ourselves from thinking that the past um, you know, wouldn't have happened and that the other person would uh, apologize. It's not, a, uh, we're not looking for, a, for apologies, it's forgiveness of, freeing the person who, who, ha, who have been hurt from, uh, from holding all the, the negative emotions and thoughts. So I wonder what do you think about it, especially when we're talking about palliative care intervention with the arts. Uh, there are actually, I'm just gonna say that there are some papers about gratitude, gratitude and psychodrama. There is a paper about gratitude and psychodrama. But I wonder what do you think about forgiveness? This is one. And the second question is that uh, I had the, the focus group of our uh, uh, research uh, of the Erasmus program. And one of the most interesting things that the student uh, said is that the arts, especially the tangible art forms that are drawing or sculpting, they are tangible, they are concrete and they remain after the person is dying, is dead. So in a way, this is something that was very powerful to realize that it can be something that stays there in the, in the material world after the person is dying. And, and this is not the same as drama because drama is, is very, very dynamic and movement and drama, drama therapy, psychodrama or dance movement therapy it's not documented. Even music can be documented and recorded more easily than drama. So I just wonder what you think about those two issues. Thank you. Yes, we don't hear you. Just unmute. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you, Hod. Uh, forgiveness uh, is tremendously important and actually, um, 
my my original interest in gratitude comes from a colleague here at Skidmore, uh, Mark Rye, whose work was originally on forgiveness. And, and uh, you're quite right. He is he found forgiveness to have very potent and palliative effects along the lines of what we're finding um, with gratitude. So I think that that that's an important addition uh, to uh, the armament uh, the existential anxiety buffers that are benign or benevolent. Um, your other point about art, uh, uh, what Otto Rank refers to as the plastic arts, because they're tangible, that, that's just brilliant. In his book, Art and Artist, he talks about um, uh, the yearning for immortality underlying artistic creation Without, uh, without stipulating that this is necessarily a defensive affectation. Uh, and even though his language is difficult, uh, uh, what, what Ronk says is that art is the objectification of subjectivity. Suzanne Langer, the philosopher, says uh, the same thing. In another place, Ronk says it's the concretization of the abstract. Uh, and so there's two things that are great uh, about, you know, plastic art. Uh, you know, Suzanne Langer says, well, you, you're making something and then you're looking at your own creation. And so Langer borrowing from Freud, she's like, well, your artwork is a projection of the internal psychodynamic activities of which you have no direct contact with. And, and so uh, uh, it, by viewing a work of art that you've created yourself in part, that's a good way that you can come to know yourself. But then there's the fact, as you mentioned so eloquently, Hot, and that is that uh, you make something and you walk away. Uh, and in principle, the artistic creation persists over time. So you get that whiff of symbolic immortality. Yeah, both excellent points. Thank you. Uh, you're mute. There are lots of uh, questions. I think uh, one we can uh, read one uh, uh, question from other participants. Uh, we had uh, about uh, eighty participants. Uh, so, Sylvia, can you uh, read? I don't know. Uh, I... So there is a. Um... There is uh, there was one participant saying um, could somebody could something about about consumerism and the figure of zombies be interesting? It was a a question in the chat. Yes, yes I'm, I'm, not not sure. Sure. I'm not sure of, about the zombie part because that's got a lot of connotations, all of which I'm ignorant of. Uh, the consumerism part, um, we could spend hours or days on. Um, we um, have written, as has Becker, um, extensively on the idea that uh, consumerism is a secular religion, that, that when Nietzsche said God is dead, uh, Becker's point is, yeah, maybe God's dead, but the yearnings uh, for a connection to a transcendent power uh, have not dissipated. Uh, they've simply been transferred to an insatiable desire for money and stuff. Uh, and so the pursuit, uh, the unbridled pursuit of money and stuff um, is the motivational dynamic for life in the world that we now inhabit. Uh, and Max Weber, um, he saw what was happening. Some of you might know his allusion to the gilded cage. Uh, Weber said, look, early on uh, the Industrial Revolution, well, it was good for everybody 
uh, because we were able to make stuff and life got better. And then Weber said, we got imprisoned in our own gilded cage that, that uh, instead of making stuff to make life better, uh, we now are devoted to just making and consuming stuff. And uh, it's in the Protestant work ethic book where, um, where Weber, uh, he says, and this is the most chilling line because it's written a century ago. He says, I don't think we're going to stop until the last lump of coal on earth has been burned. And he, uh, uh, here we are. So yes, I think there's a big role uh, for thinking about consumerism uh, in existential terms, noting that we don't, let's not be simpletons. If you like living, uh, then you're a consumer. Uh, that, that's all there is to it, whether we like it or not. Uh, but uh, I like uh, Mary Poppins, who said enough is as good as a feast, uh, more than I like uh, people like back in the days, Ivan Bosky, uh, he's a rich dude in America and also a criminal who said greed is good, or what good is the moon if you can't buy or sell it? I think we lost you, Ines. Ines, we can't Ines, hear you. Yeah, we're not hearing you, although you're not muted. Um, okay. So I'm here. Oh, now it's okay. Now it's okay. I think, uh, uh, Sheldon, we absolutely are absolutely uh, enthusiastic of uh, your four meetings. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your research. Thank you for your collaboration with us. We really hope uh, we can meet you again in the PhD uh, that uh, our uh, department is uh, creating. Uh, we really hope you can collaborate with us uh, uh, with uh, your uh, suggestions uh, and uh, your teaching because uh, it is absolutely uh, um, useful, uh, especially in the area where uh, um, we have to cure, we have to uh, assist people who have to die. And so thank you so much for everything. Thank you so much for all of you that uh, are with, our, with us. And uh, we hope to meet you again soon. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you very much. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Professor Ines Testoni, for leadership and organizing this. Thank you very much.